Well, uh, again, alright everybody, welcome, I'm glad you were able to come, sorry for the delay uh, since the last lecture because I've been very busy as of late. Uh, for the good people watching this on YouTube, I have put a skip button in the comments uh, below, in the top comment, that way you can skip to the lore right away, or you can listen to me explaining the, the concept once more. Alright, uh, I reckon everybody present by now knows the rules, keep your microphone muted during the lecture, in the middle of it we will have a 10 minute break which we can answer some questions in, you can fill your drinks, go to the toilet, whatever you, you want to do, feed your cat or something like that. I also know that I might anger some people with this lecture, as I called this lecture a Moretic Era, but it's more or less development during the Moretic Era, I decided to chop the lecture in two, in two parts, so the part one which we attend now and part two which will be held later for the patrons. Uh, as both history and development would be too much to fit in one half an hour to 45 minutes. So today we'll be covering the development and next lecture we'll be going over the history in more, far more detail. As I personally think that that way we will be able to satisfy almost everyone. Because I personally felt that doing both those subjects in this half hour would do justice to neither of the subjects. And I expect the history lecture to be finished in about a couple of weeks, uh, maybe even shorter than that since I've had a lot of time to prepare it since last lecture. Again, sorry, been busy. Please keep in mind that most of the things in the big history lectures are not my expertise in the necessar necessarily. Uh, they are merely me picking together sources and logic trying to get everything into a comprehensible story. It's more of a hobby thing than a real uh, expertise thing. So today we'll be talking about the development during the Moretic Era, so that means we will be largely talking about the things we don't know a hell of a lot about from lore, since there's simply not that many sources on. From the Moretic Era we know a lot of events, however most of them we cannot really place on a coherent time scale, so putting this all in a coherent order is a bit hard for me, but I tried anyway. Now today, next to a bit of regular Elder Scrolls history, we will be mainly talking about the development of the races of Nern, and how this development went fundamentally different from that of the human race in our own universe. Now, we already talked about this in the last lecture, but I wish to expand upon that, as in my personal hypothesis, this radically different development largely relates to the fact that development in the Elder Scrolls history is uh, now stagnant for centuries, not really developing much beyond medieval times in a time span of thousands of years. I mean, think about the first era until the fourth era, there isn't much difference in terms of technology, while it, it has been thousands of years, while in our own universe, Humans developed in a few hundred years since the beginning of the medieval era to a point where a random Dutch guy can lecture a couple of Americans and Britons through some electronic devices. So that says something about the difference in development speed between the universes. And I think that's pretty curious, since the Elder Scrolls civilizations have, has, have, have had largely the same developments as the human race, other than magic of course. I mean, they have developed agricultural skills, so the agrarian revolutions effects were the, both for both were the same for both cases. However, the way that revolution happened was radically different. For example, both civilizations learned how to write, which resulted in both civilizations to have the ability for administration, history keeping, those kind of things. But then again, this invention of writing went in such a radically different way compared to that of our own universe, while the effects of the invention on the short term were the same, so learning how to write, keeping administration, in the long term, things like those, not specifically the writing, but things like that, those kind of developments resulted in the Elder Scrolls universe being in stagnation. And in our own universe it led to rapid development, so we have computers and those kind of things. And in that same category, there are many things that on one hand seem to have been going in the same way as our own development, yet because the origin of the inventions and the developments were different than ours, the long time effects of the developments in the Elder Scrolls universe resulted in stagnation. I'm trailing off a bit, but, but let's pick up where we left off in the last lecture. After the Elnofe Wars, groups of wandering Elnofe offspring and groups of old Elnofe inhabitants offspring were get scattered around Nern. And these now separated groups would, in their separation, evolve into the races as we know them now, or at least the precursors of the races as we know them now. People who missed the first lecture will think, hey, are there not all kind of different creation myths per race? And yes, that's true. However, there is no scientific basis to believe any creation myth other than partly the elvish creation myth, which states that the elvish races stem from both 
Who stand, that stand, the elf is racist stem from the old Elnafay inhabitants and the human race is stem from the wandering Elnafay. And both those two races then stemmed from a common ancestor, the original Elnafay, making men and elves have a common ancestor, which explains why their DNA allows them to crossbreed in this universe. Now, if you want more info on that, just take a look at the previous lecture in the Big History series. I talked about it in quite some more detail. Now, we don't know very much about the concrete history during this time of isolation. We know that on Yokuda, the wandering Elnafay would evolve into the Yokudans, the precursors of the Red Guards. And the old Elnafay inhabitants there would evolve into the left-handed elves, or the Sinistral elves. On Old Muris, the old Elnafay inhabitants ev evolved into the Aldmer, the common ancestor of all Tamrielic elf races. On Atmora, the wandering Elnafay would evolve into the Needs, who are the common ancestors of all light-skinned Tamrielic men races. And on Ekavir, we don't quite know what happened. It is presumed that the wandering Elnafay there evolved into the men of Ekavir, who apparently all died for some reason. And the old Elnafay inhabitants there, so the, basically the, the ancestors of the elvish races on Tamriel, that they there evolved into the Sesi. That's according to some theories, but there is no proof on that. So let's take that last bit with a little grain of salt, as it's simply all theories, as we don't know much about Ekavir or what happened there at all. Now, as you hear, I very purposely <laughs> left out Tamriel out of this, as Tamriel was the domain to the only intelligent races that did not stem from the Elnafay, the Hist, and their servants, the Argonians, which they created. And they made their home on southern Tamriel. This is what I told you last time, however, I think I made a bit of a mistake in this. So, let me explain and correct myself. Last time I told you that it's very likely that the Khajiit evolved from the Bosmer, with the meddling of a Daedric Prince. While that's a pretty logical assumption, taking into account the fact that some Khajiit can apparently with effort crossbreed with the descendants of old Elnafay inhabitants, so the Mur races, I would like to correct myself on this. It is most likely that the Khajiit originated from a group of old Elnafay inhabitants that got isolated on Tamriel. Why do I say this? Well, because we know that the beast races of Argonians, Khajiit and Lilmoth, which is essentially a sort of sister race of the Khajiit, existed on southern Tamriel before any of the migration waves, waves to Tamriel. They were there before even the Aldmer landed on the Somerset Isles. So they cannot possibly, the Khajiit then cannot possibly come from the Bosmer. So if we say that the Khajiit and most likely the Lilmoth evolved from an isolated group of old Elnafay inhabitants, it would make sense why with some effort they are able to procreate with the races of Mur, and it would make sense why they were on Tamriel before the migration waves even started. Remember, the Argonians, Khajiit and Lilmoth were all just chilling on southern Tamriel at that point. Northern Tamriel, according to most sources, had no intelligent life yet. So it had animals and plants, but no race that could make itself into a developing society as we know it now. Now, as we will see during the Meretic Era, eventually all races started migrating to Tamriel for some reason, except for the Akaviri races, but even they tried at some point with their wars, with their invasions, I mean. However, before we start covering that, we need to take a look at the most curious fact. In isolation, these different races, Yakudans, left-handed elves, Needs, Aldmer, Akavir humans and Sesi, all developed to a point where they had a sedentary, mostly urban-based society. So, before they came to Tamriel, they all possessed the necessary knowledge and skills to sustain an urban-based civilization. And why do I think this is curious? Because they developed these skills all in isolation of each other. Think about our own world. This did not happen here. The population of humans in isolated areas like Australia and North and South America developed way slower and not at all in the same way as the Europeans and Asian populations. Yet in the Elder Scrolls universe, each race developed a certain advance in magic, developed writing, new ways how to sustain a population on an agricultural basis and had a language. And these all developed along largely the same tracks. A parallel development like that is truly radically different from our own world in some ways as and in my opinion the reason for that as I said in the last lecture is probably because the races of Nern except for the Argonians stem from the Ad'Ada who had to breed to survive so the creators of Mundus and in turn the creators of Nern are the direct ancestors of those who became isolated and if your ancestors are the creators it would make sense that at least some of their knowledge would be passed on throughout the many generations. A good example is writing in the Elder Scrolls universe. We know that the Ed'Ada, and thus the original Elnafay, had their own writing style. 
We can find these letters on the Eye of Magnus, meaning that the Elnofe already learned writing from their ancestors, the gods, and that, this, and that writing isn't something they needed to learn. If we look at all the, way, the ways of writing in the Elder Scrolls universe, this makes complete sense, since all styles of writing have something in common with each other. I now want you to take a look at the uh, document that I provided for you and that for the people on YouTube I will put it on the screen. In the document, I want you to take a look at the images. What do all the styles of writing in those images share with each other? So what do they have in common? I'll, have a, I'll wait a moment for everybody to get their appendixes and for the people on YouTube to study what I'll show you on screen. And I'll let you come to the same conclusion that I did, or not at all. I hope that you're all seeing what I mean. Every type of writing, even the Daedric writing, is ordered in an alphabet, making loose letters to then make up the words. So, loose letters. Not necessarily even an alphabet, just the concept of loose letters. You might think, yeah, isn't that obvious? Isn't that how you write? I mean... That's how we write, right? Well, it isn't obvious at all, as if we take a parallel to our own universe and our own world, we see that this, that, that this isn't obvious at all. It's actually quite rare. Most civilizations, like the Chinese and the early Egyptian societies in our own world, wrote with an ideographic script, meaning that they made separate complicated symbolic images for every word or sound, instead of making a symbol for every letter. I mean, in some even civilizations, like the Incas even, they used a totally different way of recording things. They used a little rope and then made little knots to record things uh, uh, with the rope. So, I don't know exactly how it worked. It was called a quipu or something like that. But imagine it something like one alpaca, one knot, two alpaca, two knots, and then you got a separate rope for llamas, and then it was like one llama, one knot. You know, you know what I mean. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that I think that all writing in the Elder Scrolls must have a similar origin. It all originates from the writing of the gods and probably all evolved from the writing of the gods. And if you continue that little line of thought, you will realize that all languages on Nern, except for the Argonian language, that's an important exception, presumably also stems from the same language of the Ed Ada, Old Elnofex. And if we continue that line even further, we also find why the races on Tamriel would be able to communicate with each other way more easily than, for example, the ancient Egyptians would when they would meet the Incas. Because their languages and writing had completely different origin, while, for example, a Mede and an Aldmer would be able to communicate way easier, as their languages and writing systems, while very different, because they evolved, but they did evolve from the same origin. And thus, there will be a lot of similarities, meaning that, in the end, they will have a better time getting along with that. Or getting on the same page. Same goes for all the aspects of development like our agriculture, building, fishing, etc. Every race was equipped with at least a basic knowledge of this of all this, stemming from their ancestors, and then developed the techniques and knowledge on their own. But because these those uh, techniques all had their same starting point, so they had their same origin in the gods, the development and the subsequent developments will always be similar along the same track. So that explains partly, while in total isolation, a lot of the races developed exactly the same skills. I mean, this did not happen in our own world, as I, as I, <laughs> as I stressed before, because in our own world, the civilizations all had to, uh, had to invent the techniques themselves. I mean, writing is the best example of this, with, for example, the Incas being the most extreme example of this with the little rope system. And this also explains why the Argonian language is described as completely different to all other languages. It has no relation to Old Elnofex, the, the language of the Elnofe. Meaning that uh, th that's, that's part of the reason why it's even stated in the novels that the Argonian language can't be learned by anyone else than an Argonian. It does not have the same starting point as the language that the other races learned. So now we know how the development of the races came about and why the races in isolation followed the same parallel development pattern to the other races in isolation. And after the little break, we will see how the, the races performed in isolation, developed some culture and how the first transcontinental migration starts. So I propose that we now hold the 10 minute break now so I can answer some questions and replenish my drink. You can all unmute your microphones now and in 10 minutes we'll be continuing. And before you ask your questions, please let me switch recording software.
So before the break, we've been talking about the developments of the different precursor races uh, that they made while they were still on their ancestral homes. Now we will see how some of them, or how some of them developed their culture and how there are some interesting pre temriatic migrations in this early stage of the Muradic era. So let's first look at the most curious event, as on the continent of Alt Murris there was a split in the population and a migration far before any other race migrant migrated to Tamriel. On the island of Alt Murris, a faction of Alt Murray people under the lead of a nobleman of the island named Orgnum led a rebellion against the standing government there at the time. This led to them being banished and they would be the first group of the precursor races ever to be forced to leave their home continents. These dissidents ended up on the small continent of Piendene and evolved into the Maomer, the Sea Elves. And their story we will detail more in the next lecture. However, the Maomer are a curious case, as when you look at the Maomer, you can see that they look radically different from their elven cousins on modern day Tamriel. While you might say, sure, but don't the Dark Elves and the Orsomer also look radically different? Yeah, but they do look different because they were changed by divine beings both by Daedric Princes, if I'm correct from the top of my head. While the, Maromer, while the Maromer's appearance to our current knowledge never changed by any of the divine beings' influence, meaning that the environment of Piennene forced them to evolve into being a radically different being than from their sister, sister races of Tamriel. So, I mean, the Aldmer, Bosmer and Dwemer, for example, they all look a bit different from one another, but they still have, for example, the same Generally a natural hair color, color of skin, same kind of eyes. The Marmor evolved all by themselves in isolation during the Moretic era into this sort of pale amphibious kind of elf. And in my opinion this is highly interesting. And if you reflect this on the point I made on the Khajiit earlier, which likely have a similar ancestor in the old Helnofe inhabitants as the other, el as the other elves, then this makes sense, as the Khajiit are even more different from the offspring races due to their longer isolation. This is something we see very extremely in the Mur races, that longer segregation from the main group of Aldmer, or old Elnafe inhabitants, leads to a more radically different species, with the Dunmer as exception. But we will talk about them in the lecture on the first era. You can even see this in the humans, as the wandering Elnafe got trapped on both the Okuda and got trapped on... Uh, at Mora, you can see this with the Needs and the Red Guards. All, all the Needs from At Mora, they evolved into light-skinned humans, while the Red Guards got isolated longer and thus evolved into a darker-skinned human. This is basically just evolution. And this migration of the Marmor was the first migration we had on Nern since the Elnofe Wars ended. But before this point, most races had been pretty confined to their own continents. However, around the same time, the Marmor would forcibly migrate to Piendene, there would be another highly influential migration, the dragons. The dragons are immortal creatures that are native to Akavir. They apparently are one of the creatures that are closest to the Ed Anna that created Mundus, especially close to Akatosh. They are said to be the children of Akatosh, which led some people online to conclude that the dragons were the result of Akatosh's breeding when the Ed Anna started breeding to survive. Which, if you think about it, isn't too crazy of an idea, because even Alduin calls himself the firstborn of Akatosh. Unfortunately, there aren't any concrete sources that directly confirm this. However, we do know that the dragons are ancient and presumably were created together with, or just after or just before, the Elnofe, or somehow came from a place that is unknown to us after the Elnofe Wars. Now, why am I being so vague on that? Because we don't know exactly where they came from. To our knowledge, they had no significant impact in the Elnofe War. They were not there during creation, but after the Elnofe War ended, they existed on Akavir for some reason. That's what we know. Now, something else we know is that there are no dragons on Akavir left, because, or at least not as we know them, because these dragons on Akavir, they were being hunted down. They were being hunted down by the Seisi, the creatures that are presumably the offspring of another Elnofe race that got isolated on Akavir after the war. The threat to the dragons was so great, so the threat posed by the Seisi, that the dragons were forced to leave Akavir for their own survival, before they as a race would be extinct or consumed, as is even said in the, uh, in the lore. This led them to migrate to Admora, the continent where an early human race called the Needs lived. These Needs were far less powerful than the Seisi had been on Akavir, and these Needs were quite primitive in their tradition, as they worshipped animals as the avatars of the gods, 
And once they saw the dragons, they saw them as the largest, smartest and most powerful races of animal and started to worship them as well. And the dragons then cleverly used this worship and veneration to rule over humanity. <laughs> this worship of the dragons created a very complex society in Atmora, fully based on the worship of dragons. The dragons would appoint humans to be their representatives in human society. They would keep the peace between the dragons and the humans by ruling the humans for the dragons in whatever way the dragons saw fit. These men were the dragon priests, and they were for all terms and purposes the leaders of the human civilization on Atmora. On Atmora they ruled pretty fairly and did a pretty good job in keeping the worship of the dragons alive, thereby sustaining the peace between dragons and humans. If there was some kind of king of Atmora or kings of Atmora, their power would have been pretty insignificant to the power that the dragon priests held, since the dragon priests were the literal line to the beings that the humans worshipped at the point. That's why, to our knowledge at least, there has never been a king of Atmora since the dragons showed up, because these kings would not have wielded any significant power. Now, this power structure worked pretty well on Atmora. A lot of people seem to think very negatively of the dragons and the dragon priests, but during this age the relations between dragon and human was very peaceful, and that was because the dragon priests communicated everything well, made sure that the laws and tributes were to the dragon's liking, and they ruled over the humans pretty fairly. The problems you're probably thinking about right now that eventually led to the Dragon War, we will talk about that next lecture, as these were the things that happened on Tamriel after the migration of the races and with like the corrupt Dragon Priest of Tamriel. While Admora during the Muratic Era was relatively peaceful, Yokuda wasn't. And Yokuda is an interesting example, as the races of Yokuda, or what was left of them in the Yokudans, would not migrate to Tamriel until the first era was well underway. On Yokuda they had their own history, of which we will shortly cover the first bit, which happened during the Meretic Era, and presumably led to the first extinct intelligent race of Nern, the left-handed elves, or Sinistral elves, which are extinct now. Now, there are many theories of where Yokuda came from. Perhaps it and its inhabitants came from a different past, according to some theories, like they, they call it the Kelpa, but I personally find that theory not too likely, but then again, whether you believe that theory, it's up for one's own interpretation. I mean, it's fully possible, but I just think, it, it, think that it isn't. If you want to know more about this still highly in interesting theory, I would suggest consulting my friend Aramithius, who has his own podcast where he talks about the more mythical side of the lore. For this lecture, however, I will be focusing on the more grounded and realist side of the lore, so for now we will conclude that the Yokudans and the left-handed elves both originally stemmed from a group of wandering Elnofe and old Elnofe inhabitants, and then got isolated on Yokuda. If you don't like my interpretation, I'm sorry, I can't help it. It's what the lecture series is built upon. Anyway, these Sinistral or left-handed elves, whatever you want to call them, they were not, a, not the biggest of friends with the Yokudans, so the ancestors of the Red Guards. And it is said that the first thousand years or so of the Muradic era, that on Yokuda it was spent with fierce war with the Yokudans and the left-handed elves among themselves. We don't know the exact reason for this war, but if I have to guess, I think that this would most likely be a continuation of the original Elnofe war on a smaller scale, as this to our knowledge is the only continent where old Elnofe inhabitants and wandering Elnofe were isolated together, with an exception being maybe Ekavir with the humans of Ekavir and the Seisi, but we don't know exactly how Ekavir fared during these days, and which the races there are actually on Ekavir we don't even know. If the humans on Ekavir were a real thing, and if the Seisi actually stemmed from the old Elnofe inhabitants, or maybe even the wandering Elnofe, if the humans on Ekavir were a thing, they most likely stemmed from the wandering Elnofe, and if the Seisi stemmed from the old Elnofe inhabitants, it would make sense in a way, since the Ekavir is also described as a land where the earliest years were spent in warfare between the races, so then possibly there too would be a continuation of the Elnofe war, which would pro possibly result into the extinction of the humans of Ekavir, if they ever existed at all. And if they ever existed, they are extinct now, we know as much. So, to bring this conversation back to Yakuda, the war that was going on uh, over there for the first thousand years or so is probably, as I said in my best speculation, a continuation of the Elnofe war. And this thousand year war would eventually led to the left-handed elves being defeated permanently by the Okudans after about a thousand years, leading the left-handed elves to extinction. The left-handed elves would be the first race, intelligent race that we know of to get extinct. It's possible that some lived under the rule of the Okudans under, the, uh, under 
uh, the Yakutans rule until the continent largely sank, but we don't know anything of that ever happening, because it's not recorded in the lore. And even if it did happen, the Sinistral Elf Society or Left-Handed Elf Society was of course extinct after it got dominated by the Red Guards, or Yokudans, which would bring their culture and their civilization to a definite end. And eventually it would lead to Yokudan culture developing relatively quickly to a point where the Yokudans would be relatively advanced com compared to their human cousins on Admora, which were relatively primitive. Now finally there's the Altmer. Uh, we know relatively little of what the Altmer did before migrating to Tamriel. However, we do know that the Altmer back then lived in Altmuris, which was apparently built upon the ruins of Old Elnofe, or was Old Elnofe, or was a place resembling Old Elnofe. Which one it is does not really become clear in the lore, however, we do know that on Altmuris, the Altmer had already a very sophisticated society that was leagues ahead of the others uh, on the track of development, but still on, the, still on the same track of development as the others. It is said that the continent was one big beautiful city and it was so big that eventually no nature remained on the island. And on it the Altmer had a very complex society that would live relatively peaceful and undisturbed. We do know however that during the Moretic era the continent would face an impending doom for some reason that would lead to the Altmer eventually migrating to Tamriel. But we will talk about that next lecture when we talk about the actual history part. Now, the only ones that we have not covered yet are the Khajiit and Argonians, and we can be really quick about them. We know literally nothing of what they did before the Altmer landed on Tamriel. We know they were there, and we know that the Argonians were actually quite advanced before the Altmer landed. And it's said that Argonian culture actually had its peak in this period before it would even be affected by other cultures. During this time they apparently created great pyramids, the pyramids of Zanmir. But other than that we don't quite know what they were doing before the Great Migration Wave started. I made a video on it and I expanded a little bit more on it uh, in that video. But it's still not much that we know. And we know even less about the Khajiit. All we know is that they basically lived in kingdoms back then and that they were pre relatively peaceful. Just like the Argonians. And they, were, they are rarely mentioned in Moretic Era history. However, it's presumed that they too went through the same development pattern as the other races, except for the Argonians, of course. In conclusion for this lecture, we can see that after getting isolated, each of the precursor races largely went their own way. And yet, the general development pattern of each of the races would follow a similar track. And that their development all had a similar origin, which led them to ultimately arrive at generally similar points. Some races would advance much quicker along the track, and some would advance a bit slower. But in general, each race would follow the same pattern, most likely because they had a similar starting point in the Elnufe, so the direct ancestors of the gods. Now, how does this explain Tamriel being in stagnation for in terms of development? Well, I'll leave that as a cliffhanger for the next lectures, when we will see the races coming together on Tamriel after the Great Migration, leaving their own continents behind all for their own reasons. I thank you very much for your enduring attention. These lectures literally get longer every time and I can't say that being silent must be easy for such a long time. So again, thanks for listening and I'll switch recording software and we can commence with eventual questions if there are any. Yeah, how did... um. See the dragon script. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure dragons can't write. Like, who came up with that? Well, uh, the idea is that the dragon script. I mean, I'm doing this from the top of my head. I'll have to fact check yeah. it. The idea is that the dragon script basically came about because the. Um, this was like the. Okay, let me correct myself. The dragons did create this because the. The, le the script was apparently designed by Bethesda or by the guy at Bethesda to actually uh, imagine as if a dragon wrote it. Like they put their claw in like the dots and then make the rest of the marks like that. I mean that was told, that was said by, I mean I believe Todd Howard or the guy that designed it in the behind the scenes of Skyrim. They actually told you that it was designed as if a dragon was writing it or was carving it in a wall or something. That's that very interesting. Yeah, so my question is, is the Red Guards and the Left-Handed Elves dealt with each other for nearly a millennia, so I was wondering if it was possible that it was interbreeding between the two, like there was with the Bretons and the Imperials. 
Well, we don't know about that. We know that the that the Red Guards, or the, at least the Okudans, uh, they don't want to talk about the left-handed elves for some reason. So we don't know a lot about the left-handed elves because the Okudans or the Red Guards are our only source about them. Now. What you're saying makes a lot of sense to me, and I personally think that it probably uh, happened. But since they were at war almost permanently, I don't think it will have had a lasting effect on, um, on the offspring. In the way that there isn't, there's probably not a variant of a Yokudan and a left-handed elf like there's a Breton. However, I think that if such a race existed, a sort of Yokudan breton that... Because there's such so much hatred for the left-handed elves, they would probably have become outcasts in society and eventually their species would have died down because they were outcasts in uh, Red Guard society or Yakudan society. And we don't know exactly how the Yakudans dealt with the last few left-handed elves, if there even were any left. I mean, history is very vague on that. And I personally think that there were probably some left-handed elves left living as sort of slaves in Yakudan culture. But I think that eventually every left-handed elf, including their possible offspring, in even if, if it was mixed with humans, eventually died down that way and eventually got just sank into the sea when Yakuda died. <laughs> okay. Um, I remember in the, the, the Dragonborn DLC in Skyrim, the... <sighs> I don't know if you remember, there's... Hermaeus Mora has, like, this giant wall where you learn... I think you learn the one word of the, um... I forget, yeah, the the one word. It has, like, the Elder Script, I think? That's, like, what is written on the Elder Scrolls? Or, I forget, it's either Elder Script or... Um, the... The Adris Script. I don't think it's that. I think it was the Elder Script. Do you know, like, why they that it was elder in Elder Script and not like in Daedric letters, and it it just seemed kind of out of place. I forget. I remember like reading on it once, but I forget like why uh, it was in Elder Script. Well, I I mean, this is a very specific question about a very specific case. But I can imagine, I mean, Hermaeus Mora has a realm filled with all kinds of books and all kinds of different lore. I mean, the books found in his, uh, uh, in his lair, or <laughs> in, his, in his plane, and the, like, for example, the Ogma Infernium, they are all not necessarily writ. I mean, I, okay, I'll check myself really quickly on the Ogma Infernium, because, yeah, I mean... The Ogma Infernium, for example, is in completely different script. I, from the small image that I have here, I can't really, really see what kind of script it is. I believe it's divine script. Uh, that's probably because Hermaeus Mora has knowledge from all kinds of languages. I mean, he has books in regular uh, script, but there's probably also enough text written in Daedra script. I mean, he collects knowledge in all its ways, so I wouldn't be surprised if there is some kind of... Uh, Adric knowledge upon in it, in it as well. Now I know which wall you mean, and yeah, it's pretty curious why that is. But to from the top of my head, I don't know. I can look if I can find it out, but uh, I haven't prepared exactly for this uh, specific case. But I think it's just because Hermes Mora collects all kinds of things uh, from all kinds of types of knowledge. And thus also from Adric type knowledge. And maybe he even uses that script because it's more convenient, maybe. Or maybe because it can say more. While the other Daedra use another script. But we don't exactly know of that. But disregard that theory because it's not really based on anything but my own interpretation. 